Hey there friends, Dave Politis, k and Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video page, and I am Dave Politis. And this is a missing person segment. We do three segments. One on missing people, one on Skinwalker Ranch, and one on the factual news, and you just tuned into Missing People. And we are broadcasting straight from the great state of Montana, about 70 miles from the Canadian border, and it's been brutally hot. But we are trying to get outside as much as we can to give you what Montana looks like. And it is, uh, water's running high right now in the rivers, but uh, the flooding has stopped and we're doing, we're doing well. So, I was gonna wear my hat today Many of you have requested a missing 411 hat, 100% cotton, now in our stores. So, if you're looking for a hat for the summer, it's here. So, hope you're having fun, and I hope that you're carrying your personal locator beacon when you go into the woods, and you're hiking with somebody, and you're telling people where you are going. Those are key points, <laughs> ultra key points. <laughs> and kind of the, uh, the hallmark of our research. So I have some pretty interesting cases for you today. And I have some really good letters. First of all, something that's near and dear to my heart bothers some people in the village that I talk about this, but I am going to continue to talk about it. And that is mental health in our society. Mental health is a number one issue in my life as my son took his life because of a mental health issue. And uh, you can watch that video right here I did about Ben. Now, CBS News had an article March 10th, 2011 and I know some of you will say, oh, that's old news days, but I doubt you've heard of this one. It says, bipolar rates higher in the USA. Why? CBS, Charlie Sheen may or may not have bipolar disorder, but new research suggests that the potentially deadly mood disorder may be more prevalent in the US than in other countries. A survey of 61,000 people in 11 countries showed that 4.4% of the Americans have the disorder. 4.4% that the potentially deadly mood disorder may be more prevalent in the U.S., which is characterized by shifts in mood from deep sadness to an almost euphoric state called mania. What about other countries? India has the lowest rate of bipolar disorder at 0.1% of the population. Other countries cited in the survey include Colombia, 2.6%, Japan, 0.7% worldwide. 2.4% of the population is bipolar across the world, according to the survey, which was published in the March issue of Archives of General Psychiatry. So, let's think about this. If 4.4% of the population in the U.S. has bipolarism, do you think maybe we should have more facilities and more doctors to address this? Exactly why Americans are more vulnerable to bipolar disorder, manic depression, isn't quite clear. Wealth may be one factor, researchers say. In general, bipolar was shown to be more prevalent in high-income nations, with Japan the lone exception. But our openness about our emotional issues may also mean that Americans are simply more likely to get proper diagnosis. Cultural awareness plays a big role in psychiatry. Dr. Sarah Bodner, sister professor of psychiatry at the University of Miami School of Medicine told CNN, some cultures have a high and huge reluctance to speak up about psychiatric things. I believe that. Whatever the reason, it's clear that bipolar takes a big toll on American health. Without appropriate treatment, often antidepressant medication in conjunction with counseling, the shifting moods and energy levels, distractibility, restless, restlessness, disturbed sleep, and other hallmarks of the illness can affect relationships, job performance, even ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks. And 
Bipolar individuals have the highest rate of suicide of any mental health condition. That is my concern. And we were told this early on with Ben. Now, the shifts from depression to mania are mind-blowing. If you've been a parent, you've been a brother or sister, and you've seen this happen, you understand. And what's happened is, is sometimes the relatives of the bipolar people take and are targets of verbal attacks by people who are bipolar. It's absolutely a brutal thing to go for, go through, brutal. Until I understand it, I internalize much of it that it must have been my fault. But then I understood why it was happening and the paradigm shifted totally. Folks, I'm not going to get on a platform and, and scream from the hills, but I am going to say that we need more mental health treatment centers. We need a thousand times more than what we have today. And until we are willing to address this as a nation, we're going to have issues of homelessness, violence, and other items associated with being bipolar. It's a horrendous condition. And I feel very, very sorry for young parents right now who have no clue that their son or daughter may be bipolar and have no clue what to do as they get older. It devastated our family. Next letter. I'm listening to your letters. David Politis, Missing Person Cases from California and Washington. My theory on mental health in human society now. In our society, we are kept immature in order to keep us domesticated. Various forms of covert applied behavioral psychology are used that prevent human beings from becoming integrated intellect with animal and ego instinct. Just as a dog is not a wolf, humans are not mature mentally and physically disciplined and or civilized. Our forced domestication precludes our civilization. That's interesting. Individuals, we are in an adverse relationship internally. We value the intellect and ignore our animal or instinct. This adversity inside most individuals is reflected in our greater societies and up another fractal level to the whole of our planet. Here in the once United States, now the divided United States, we have the left versus the right, see? In Earth, we have communism versus capitalism, east versus west, left versus right. Inside each of us, intellect versus nature here, eyes or ears. Some cultures have learned to facilitate integration with various ceremonies and practices, and these cultures were more civilized than ever we are now. In my opinion, cultures called pagan and barbarian? Now we have people handed guns. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm in the silo, if you haven't noticed. And the silo is kind of dusty. Now we have people handed guns and sent out to protect us who do not know themselves internally. Many law enforcement officers have achieved integration and levels of maturity, but too many have not and do not even know that this is a problem. When the animal is caged and ignored by the intellect in an individual that, in an individual, that individual is at risk of out of control behavior and all of a sudden the animal, when threatened, breaks out of his or her cage and takes control. Sometimes this results in murder, too many times in my opinion. So for God's sakes and for the mental health of humanity, I say we need to deal better with our lack of integration. What do you think? Let me talk about the police officers for a second. I know about this because I hear about the other side. You only hear the negative things about police because that's what the press gives us. You don't hear about the things 10 times more common about police doing great things because the press doesn't believe that's what sells. And I know 
many police officers on a daily basis do things that go completely unrecognized, unacknowledged. And in their heart, the vast, vast majority of police officers are great people. That's how they got their job. And I know some of you have distorted ideas about police based on what you are told on a daily basis. They're this, they're that, they're this, they're that. They do this, they do that. After a while, you tend to believe it, but that's not reality. How do I know? Because I've read daily excerpts from certain sites about the great things police officers do that you never know about. Next letter. I have a short story to share about what happened one night fishing. Night fishing. Start off with, I want to say that I've been following your work for 10 plus years. I was hooked from the start. I think if you made a missing 411 test that could ace it, no problem. My name is Adam and I'm a wildlife biologist from San Jose, California, your old stomping grounds. As an only child of a single parent, I spent a ton of time in the Sierra Nevadas as my mother was very into horseback riding. We'd camp for a few weeks at a time in large groups and I would go off on my own every day and go fishing and exploring in very remote places, including the Desolation Valley Wilderness and the Rubicon Trail. So that area is filled with granite. That is the area directly west of Lake Tahoe, kind of between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe. Gorgeous region. I can't say enough great things about it. With all that being said, I feel very fortunate to have not gone missing or had any strange experiences during that time in my life. I'm writing you because I would like to tell you about in the village about a very strange experience I had in 2016 on the full moon of July at Lake Berryessa. <clears throat> now Lake Berryessa, interesting place. First of all, the Zodiac Killer killed somebody right near the shores of Lake Berryessa. The, um, the lake has some really remote areas. <clears throat> It's sort of in the Central Valley area um, between the Bay Area and Sacramento and a little bit north. It's a, it's a nice lake. It's big. A buddy of mine from college was in a bass fishing club that was having a night tournament at Berryessa and my buddy didn't have a, a boat, but I did. He invited me as a guest so we could fish together. The tournament was 14 hours long and ran from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. Everything started out totally normal. The fish were biting and I was having a blast catching smallmouth bass on a homemade top water fishing lure. We fished hard through dusk and finally took a breath at around 10 p.m. after it was 100% dark. I bleached my boat to, I beached my boat to eat dinner and called my then fiance, now wife, to check in. This is when everything started to get weird. As I was talking to her, I noticed a flashlight in the distance on the shore heading right towards us. This is strange because we were on a pretty remote part of the lake. Someone would have to walk miles to get there as there are no roads in this area. I kept my eye on it as I was talking to my fiance and it slowly got closer. As it drew nearer, I told her, I gotta go, there is someone with a flashlight coming our way. I hung up the phone and about 15 seconds later, the white light that was coming towards us just kind of zoomed off into the trees. Needless to say, we were a little tripped out, but no harm, no foul. We finished our food and continued fishing. We we're probably about two miles from where we saw the first light, and it now, I'm guessing, was 1 a.m. We were in a small cove, and out of nowhere, this now green softball-sized light comes out of the woods and starts slowly cruising around the tree line and shore approximately 75 to 100 yards away. I look at my buddy and I said, are you seeing this? And he responds, yes. We watched this orb for a few minutes. We start deducing the possibilities. Maybe it's a drone, we said. The only problem with that theory is that it was absolutely dead silent. Some of my friends and drones, I had worked with drones by this time and knew that it wasn't a possibility. The green orb would slowly float around in a very flowing manner that I can only compare to a butterfly, bat, or something. 
It did not move in straight lines and made no sharp turns and it never stopped. It would fly at ground level and maybe up to 20 feet in the air. As it would cruise through the trees, it would illuminate everything around it. And as it came out of the trees again, it would just be a glowing ball of light. It seemed to me to be very erratic and not really have any rhyme or reason for what it was doing. It just seemed to be aimlessly flying around about a 200 yard area. It never flew over the water, which I find interesting. If it had, I would have not been as comfortable around it. We were now starting a trip out and I decided to try to take pictures and video on my cell phone. Well, the cameras on the phones at this time were not very good at taking low light pictures. And when I took the pictures, it was just black with a tiny dot. Thank you for at least trying to take the picture. Many of you will talk about something and taking a photo never even crossed your mind. But I'm glad this man did. Congratulations. We continued watching this thing for, our, I honestly don't know how long, maybe two or three hours. The time was a little fuzzy. Most people who see something like this only catch a glimpse or see it for a moment. We watched this thing for hours. We were both incredibly intrigued. I finally realized what we were looking at was unexplainable and that I could not figure out what it was. At some point, I took my buddy and I said, I've seen enough. I'm over it. Let's get the heck out of here. Not the word I use. I fired up the boat and we hightailed it out. I drove probably two miles away and stopped and started fishing again. But this fantastic story doesn't end here. We drove two miles away in the boat, but the cove we were, the cove where we saw the orb was pro probably only a half mile from where we were now as the crow flies. I've always been really good with direction. I'm Irish and this is why I never got lost when I was my, by myself in the Sierras. I knew which way the cove was from where we were now and I was watching in that direction. I'm getting goosebumps as I write this. I had this intuitional feeling that it was coming. I just kept watching in that direction. Five minutes later, I see it coming over a large hill from that direction and it was heading right for us. Once again, I said, the heck with this, we are getting out of here. I fired up the boat again and hammered the throttle and drove probably 10 miles to a totally different part of the lake. We never saw it again. The tournament weigh-in was at 8 a.m. As we were weighing in, I was casually asking everyone if they saw anything weird. Of course, they said no. We didn't tell anyone that day. I've since only told a handful of people and they usually don't listen or just give me a blank stare. I consider myself to be a pretty reasonable person and have had many years to think about what we saw. One of my original theories was that it was a prototype drone from Lawrence Livermore Labs, which, as you know, is somewhat nearby. Yeah, Livermore, California is not that far away from this. I decided that was probably not the case because as my research taught me that people have been seeing these things forever, at least hundreds of years. And as I said, it was so fluid in its movements, I don't know how anything man-made could fly like that. I actually saw on a TV show the exact same thing we saw that night on an invasive python, python hunting show in the Everglades. It was exactly the same, green softball size light in the middle of nowhere. It was on camera for a couple of seconds, then zoomed off. Most people who see these things don't get to see them for very long. We were able to observe the sword for probably two hours. I got to stare and stare and stare as, as it maneuvered all over the cove. I had time to watch and really think about what we were looking at. I often wonder if my curiosity had gotten the best of me and would have happened if I had approached the orb. I also now wish I had tried harder to film it. We were so caught up in the fishing tournament, that was our priority. I also had a spotlight that I wish I had tried to shine a light on it. I honestly wish I could have had done something to get proof. Now I'm just a guy with a crazy story and you have to just take my word. I would. I would do things very differently now, but the time it was the last thing I thought of that was going to happen that night, and we were just overwhelmed by the moment and the experience. I'm kind of in a weird place mentally about the whole ordeal. Prior to this happening, if somebody had told me the same story, I don't think I would have believed it. I am now way more likely to believe strange stories than I was before. I think this is a good thing because when you read the letters about the crazy crap, this happened to people in the woods. I never write them off. 
and I truly critically think about what has been observed by others. I do know for a fact that there are things out there we just don't understand and there are plenty more mysteries on this planet. I wonder if orbs are around in the daytime, but we just can't see them. I did my best to keep this short. I included all the really important parts. I now really understand why people don't talk about the weird things. I literally want to tell everyone, but the people I have told their reactions haven't been that great. So I only tell my closest friends and relatives and they really don't know what to think of it. Well, coming from a wildlife biologist, I think it's interesting. A lot of people don't talk about it. I'm glad you did. P.S. I just watched the video with the letter about the zero point energy and have the topography creating a motherboard. This is somewhat similar to Dr. Travis Taylor at Skinwalker Ranch was suggesting about the topography. I found this as enthralling as you did. I would also be very curious as to the water conditions during the time of any clusters such as El Nino, flooding, drought, lake levels, Merced River flows, aquifer levels. We need the PhD who analyzed the moon phase data to analyze the water condition data too. His research was incredible. I do believe that if this was the case, the water conditions would be similar during the years that clusters occur. Maybe this happens when a certain aquifer is at a certain level and when the ground isn't saturated. It's slightly frustrating because the combinations of the conditions it could possibly take to make this happen are almost infinite. But maybe it is obvious enough to stand out. I think the most important question to ask is, this just a random freak break in the space-time continuum due to natural conditions? Or maybe these conditions just allow the entity to access dimension. If these portals are created by an entity, then it gets really weird and who knows their intent and if they are friend or foe. These disappearances do seem targeted to me, not really because of who, but because it only happens when nobody is looking. Either way, people disappear who should not, and this is a scary mystery that needs to be solved. Thanks for all your time and effort. We're listening intently and we're getting close to the answer. Well, thank you for that. First of all, people with science backgrounds that are used to going into wildlife and extrapolating data to understand conditions is an important scenario. And this man really came forward and said what he saw. Now the orb part of it, I personally have never seen an orb. As I've told you before, I've seen UFOs and I know it was a, a very odd UFO, but the orb situation has been seen by many of my friends. And I've had people over water see them, near water, in the mountains, in the cities, all over. So, very, very common occurrence. What is happening there? I wish I knew. Next letter. I've been following you for a couple years and a lot, like countless others, I really appreciate what you're doing for both the missing people and mental health. Both my wife and daughter suffer from anxiety and depression, so I know all too well its effect and it's good to see people like you using their platform to shed light on the issue. Your latest YouTube had a case where a victim's clothes were neatly folded and found relatively close to the body. Having followed your work, I recall that this has happened in many cases. Just curious if you know of any type of forensics that have been done on the clothes. It'd be interesting to know if any DNA from other victims, human or otherwise, were found on the items. Just curious. Good question. You, you, the village, are informed. 99.99999% of the U.S. public doesn't even know about what I do. And the vast, vast majority of search and rescue professionals don't know what I do. But when search and rescue goes out looking for someone, they are intent on finding them. And in their mind, there's nothing unusual that has happened because they haven't been trained in this. They aren't looking for the unusual. If they find missing clothing, they immediately think, oh, person got hypothermic and started stripping clothes. 
Well, I have too many cases where the person stripped their clothes in very close proximity to where they disappeared. Hypothermia couldn't have set in. I have many, many cases where people stripped their clothes and the temperature outside was 80 degrees. Hypothermia couldn't set in. But that's the answer that search and rescue people are given to soothe their, con their concerns over the stripped clothes. So they give the clothes back to the family or to the victim and they never even think about it. They don't even care. And law enforcement doesn't care because they don't think anything odd has happened. This research has to reach a whole different level for people to understand the importance of what you just asked. And it is important to understand. I'd be interested in knowing that were the clothes sterilized? Was there anything on the clothes? Did the victim fold the clothes? Who did fold the clothes and why? Next letter. Dear Dave, so good to see glimmers of joy in your life and you, with your family, new family member Huck, after going through the loss of Ben. May you and Angie have a gracious life with your new family member by your side. Huck, our great Pyrenees dog. She's nine months old, weighs about 90 pounds, probably get up to about 120. Changed the whole dynamic of our life and lots of joy. Very, very lovable, lovable dog. And ferocious at times when she feels we or she is threatened. And uh, I learned a lot from being around her and uh, I'm grateful. I have gratitude for that dog. These marvelous innocent souls, the dogs, are God's priceless gifts to this earth in my opinion. On another note, something I haven't thought about in decades came to me a few months back. During my junior year of high school in the late 80s, a hypnotist was invited to entertain and perform for students in our school theater. I recall him speaking with approximately 200 or so of the students as he performed a series of mental exercises that he walked us all through. I remember wanting very much to be hypnotized and following his direction carefully. He explained that some of the group would be coming on stage and that some may not. I sat in my seat in awe of how at least 30% of the students in the theater went up on stage and followed his suggestions of the most peculiar nature. They were all acting in the most embarrassing ways, which surely no one should under normal circumstances. When the exercise was over, none of the hypnotized students could recall their annex on stage. I remember wondering, what it was all about, and some of the others made it possible for us to be hypnotized, yet others so easily influenced. I was completely openly hypno I was completely openly hypnosis, yet couldn't be put under. A lot of people can't be put under hypnosis. M many. It seems there's an obvious power over the mind that enables some type of entity to control and manipulate victims of disappearances and abductions some sort of link that can be turned on and off in the subconscious or unconscious. I've read that dark entities don't have a soul and never incarnate or evolve to a higher spiritual plane and possibly eternally bound to earth. No way to know for sure, I suppose. Do you believe in reincarnation, Dave? Until one reaches a certain point of spiritual evolvement, do you mind me asking if Ben was of the belief in reincarnation with the Krishna? I hope it's not an overstep, but I've thought about spiritual evolution. One we are done with in this life. Constantly curious, best wishes. So I've been around many, many hundreds of Krishna people. And reincarnation is part of that that runs through the gamut. And if you reach that higher spiritual plane, they believe that you will come back as another human. If you never reach that higher plane, then you come back as a lower entity, say a bird, a mammal, or something. 
it's an interesting dynamic. And to think that when our life is over here, that our soul is done and we go to heaven, but we never come back to earth. It's a tough pill for many to swallow. The idea that souls are used again and again to come back as other entities, again, mammals, birds, insects. And there are many believe that every living thing on earth has a soul. There are others who believe only the higher level mammals have souls. I think that's something that you have to do your research on and come to your own belief systems. Now, we have three really, really good cases for you today. And I want to tell you that we have several subsections of missing people. Just talk to you about a couple of them. Hunters. Hunters who go into the woods. Why them? I want you to think about this. Hunters don't normally stay on trails. Most hunters go off trail and try to get into remote parts of the wilderness in an area where their sick is confined or they are upwind from their game and they hide. Another subgroup is berry pickers and mushroom pickers. They are exactly like hunters. They don't stay on trails. They get off trail. They're bent over. They aren't obvious at times. And a bear, mountain lion, could walk right up, right up to them sometimes, bit depending on the weather conditions. Now, I personally have not done any research to understand how many berry pickers or mushroom pickers have been attacked by predators. But I don't think it's many. Most of the time, berry pickers, mushroom pickers go out with others to do to do the collecting. I talked to you about this because many of you don't understand why these certain groups disappear more than other groups. To me, it's a hard time to understand why hunters disappear in the numbers they do versus the pickers. The hunters have a very loud microphone. That's their weapon, their rifle. And if you're a bow hunter, you should be carrying, unless the law says no, you should be carrying a big bore pistol as well. So let's get right into the stories. The first one occurred in Alberta, Canada. Anton Cahoot, 70 years old, went missing August 3rd, 1944. Now, he lived in Coleman, Alberta. I'll show you this map. So Coleman is right here. This is the U.S. border. This is Glacier National Park. I live down near the bottom of this map right here. This region where he lived, very remote, even today. So in his day, it was probably really remote. Now, if you've never been to Waterton Park, Glacier turns into Waterton when you cross into Canada. Gorgeous location you should visit. So, Anton goes out with some friends. He's 70 years old. He knew the area like his backyard because he'd lived there for many years. He spoke broken English. Well, during the afternoon, they were picking. He somehow got separated from the rest of the pickers. And let me stop there. Whatever you're doing, whether it's mushroom picking, berry picking, in the wilderness, picking flowers, pay attention to your surrounding. Don't keep your head down all the time and know where your friends are. When Angie and I go out berry picking, 
oftentimes we're talking to each other as we're picking kind of keeping each other in audio distance closeness just so we know where we are and uh, that is important well when Anton disappeared his friends searched through the late afternoon and the evening they couldn't locate him and they called the RCMP well the most famous dog this is a quote from the RCMP in the articles that I reviewed the most famous dog in the RCMP in that region responded from Tabor and that was on August 8th five days after he disappeared the dog found nothing couldn't even pick up a scent well at that time his wife told friends that at certain times Anton would have memory lapses okay 70 years old probably everybody at that age has a memory lapse every once in a while but that didn't mean he had dementia or he had Alzheimer's he was last seen wearing a long sleeve sweater and dark pants there was a five-day search and rescue and they found nothing it was 40 miles from where he disappeared to the US border. I live 70 miles south of that border. Nothing of Anton was ever found. Now, I don't care even if you have a memory lapse. I don't care if you have Alzheimer's. I don't care if you have dementia. That dog should have picked up a scent. Dogs should pick up a scent all the time. Now, being the best dog in that entire region, according to the RCMP, Doug should have picked up the scent. He should have been found. It's bizarre. Happens too much to count. But in this case, he was a berry picker. We had point of separation between he and the other pickers. He was picking along York Creek water and canine couldn't pick up a scent and trackers didn't find any tracks. So where did he go? Another in a long line of berry pickers that has always concerned me, always. Now the next two cases, you're going to find some huge associations with this so pay close attention first case involves a man named ed gross g-r-o-s-s -S, 46 years old missing october 4th 1931 he was a deer hunter he owned a gas station in kelso washington i've stayed there before for a bigfoot conference there spoke about missing people at a huge conference, a really good conference. That's the one that I had to cancel this last year because of threats to my life. He was hunting with two friends, Leo Tomani, who was a Kelso, Kelso councilman, and a man named Herbert Coulter, a good friend. Well, they arrived into the woods on Friday, October 2nd, and they kind of hunted together Saturday. Sunday, they went out October 4th, and they split up and agreed to come back to their camp at dusk. Well, Leo and Herbert arrived back to camp. Ed never did. Many of the articles said that Ed Gross was the most experienced hunter and woodsman in that region of the state of Washington. Can you believe that? What an accolade. So in that area of Southern Washington, you couldn't get someone with more experience. Well, Leo and Herbert searched the next day, all day for their friend. And again, if you understand the mindset, Ed's that experience, Ed's that good of a woodsman, maybe you shouldn't have, maybe you shouldn't pull the trigger on notifying the police or sheriffs right away, he'll come out. It's probably what they thought and why they searched. 
but they didn't find him. And they called the sheriff on October 6th. On October 7th, 50 searchers were there when they heard about Ed. Now, Ed was a pretty well-known guy in that part of Washington because he owned a gas station in Kelso. So when his customers heard about it, they flocked to the area. Well, also on October 7th, when the searchers showed up, that was Ed's 47th birthday. And while they were out, they heard a sh two shots fired near a place called Fawn Lake. Now, if you're a hunter, you should know this. You fire three shots in consistent progression. Boom, boom, boom. That means someone needs help. Well, they heard two. Search was moved that area. October 8th, two bloodhounds arrived from the sheriff. And at the same time, Mrs. Gross posted a $300 reward trying to get more people to come into the area. Now, the next day, this is weird that I found this, but it said the most famous police dog in Seattle arrived and searched for two days. Ed had one day of food with him. On October 9th, 40 searchers showed up. And again, Mrs. Gross posted the reward hoping to get more searchers out into the field. Also on October 9th, they found tracks in the Green River and Tuttle River areas. So, first, the Longview Kelso area down in, down in this area right here. This is the region that he was hunting in, Ed. This is Mount St. Helens. And the area was right at the base of Mount St. Helens that they were looking. Now, obviously, Mount St. Helens isn't today what it was in 1931. 1931, this whole area was very thick, a lot of wildlife, and a lot of strange stories. And I mean a lot of strange stories in that area. Since the volcano blew, hasn't been so strange. But the time that Ed Gross disappeared, very strange. And this is the Columbia River down in here. This is Portland down at the bottom. This whole region up through here, high strangeness for a multitude of reasons. When I found Ed's case, it intrigued me for many reasons. First of all, he was hunting around several bodies of water that flowed. Being an outdoorsman, you know you follow that river and you're going to get home eventually. The idea that he was lost with Mount St. Helens staring at him, hard to believe. You have a giant, giant mountain there. You know exactly where you are most of the time. The tracks that were found, they thought they were Ed's, but they lost them quickly. Put canines on them, didn't follow them. Four weeks of searching, one of the longest searches in 1931 for that time era I've ever seen, Ed Gross was never found. Does it surprise me? Uh, I guess in some ways it does, because they put forth such an effort and they brought in so many different canines. In another sense, the forest was really, really thick back then. And they had a lot of area to cover. He was in good shape for 46 years old. That's how old he was when he disappeared. And he could probably walk a lot of people into the ground based on his condition and his outdoor nature. When I was researching this case, Another case immediately came to mind, and it's quite a different case. I have written about skiers who have disappeared. This is kind of about that. A man named Joe Carter, this is a very famous case, 32 years old, 
went missing May 21st, 1950 at 3 p.m. on the side of Mount St. Helens. Again, back in 1950, I guess it wasn't such a big threat to blow, but Mount St. Helens is here, Portland is right here, Longview, Washington is right here. There's a road just north of Longview that I've taken a gorgeous ride, and you can take it right out to Mount St. Helens and see what's left now. It's a very, very impressive site. But back in 1950, when Joe disappeared, it was a big mountain, and a lot of people would climb it. And it was a pretty easy mountain to ski down, and a lot of people brought their skis, hiked up the mountain, and then skied down. Well, Joe was an expert level skier. He was a member of the National Ski Patrol. For anyone who doesn't know what that means, they are probably the most advanced, trained, and experienced skiers that uh, patrol the mountains and resorts that we ski at. Well, Joe was a member, and he had been a member of a long time. <clears throat> and when I say he was an expert skier, that doesn't mean that he could ski down the slopes fast and ski through slaloms. When you're a ski patrol member, you also have to be very, very good at taking a toboggan down the hill behind you. That means essentially being in a snowplow down for sometimes a mile or two. You gotta be in really good shape. Your legs gotta be really strong. Well, Joe Carter was with 20 other people and they reached the summit of Mount St. Helens and they were getting ready to ski down. Well, Joe was also a photographer and he told the group that the way they were going down, they were gonna go down this sort of glacier and go around this turn. And Joe said he would set up right around the turn and he would photograph the people as they came down. Well, he was a ski patrolman at a place called Milwaukee Bowl back in the 50s, if you want to look it up, see where he did work as a job. Well, Joe went up, skied around the corner, and apparently set up to photograph. When the climbers came, started to ski down around this corner, Joe wasn't there. Where was he? Well, they all stopped because they saw some things in the snow where it appeared Joe had stopped and done something. And it was some of the packaging for film. It appeared that he had taken this film canister out and was loading his camera, put the stuff on the ground for a second, and something happened. Joe wasn't there. But through the snow, they could see his tracks going down the hill. And the people at the scene and searchers who went out looking for Joe described it as a wild, death-defying run. They said he jumped three crevasses. And one story said he went straight off the cliff into what was called Ape Canyon. Other people said that he stopped at the edge of the canyon and then went off. Two different versions. Most articles said it appeared he was skiing for his life. That's right, folks. So, when the searchers got there and they realized that he was down in this canyon, hundreds and hundreds of feet below, they focused their efforts there. And they put dozens of searchers down in the canyon looking for a body. Well, guess what? They didn't find the skis and they never found Joe. They didn't find any tracks on the ground following his ski tracks down the mountain. Just his. Now, Joe was a diabetic. Down in the bottom of Ape Canyon, there's a, there's a creek. 
He was just above Timberline when all of this happened. There was a 10 day search and rescue for Joe Carter. He was also in another subgroup, photographers. A lot of people taking pictures disappear. Why is that? Is it because they're focused on their lens and what they're looking through the camera and they're not seeing around them? Well, that's not true because Joe saw something. Maybe the camera was never loaded. I don't know. But from the point where they found his packaging material, again, straight down the mountain, two skis, never slowed down, never stopped. What in the heck? could have scared a 32 year old man, expert skier, that much to take his own life going over that cliff. Tell me. Now, Ed Gross was hunting at the bottom of Mount St. Helens. Joe Carter was skiing on the side of Mount St. Helens. The 19 other people that were with Joe Carter never heard never saw, never felt anything unusual on that trip. They were all interviewed by the sheriff. As far as, as far as the searchers, there was one searcher that was looking for Joe in Ape Canyon that reported being quite uncomfortable and felt he was being watched. That was on one report. Not sure what that means, but I tell people you need to be aware of those things when you feel those things. Criteria, well, he's a photographer. He probably landed in or near water in that creek. He was never found. Biggest thing, point of separation. When Joe Carter separated from that group, something happened. Probably one of the strangest stories I've ever chronicled. People have asked me who have read this story in our books, Missing 411, The Devil's in the Detail, that story's in, one of the longer ones. Maybe you wanted to commit suicide. Somebody said that and I thought, 32 years old, expert skier, just summited Mount St. Helens, stops and is taking film, to load in his camera and all of a sudden he has a change of heart and decides to kill himself by skiing off a cliff? I don't think so. I think something else happened. And whatever happened had to have been in the air that was scaring him. Think about that. There was no tracks on the ground, so it couldn't have been on the ground. It had to be in the air. But what could have been in the air that would have scared him that much? I don't know. Friends, the missing 411 stories and the disappearances in the wilderness defy logic and explanation. There's no way Joe Carter should have not been found. He went off a cliff. They knew exactly where and when he went off. The water below in the river, the creek, wasn't high enough at the time to take his body and float it away. So, could it be said that whatever was chasing Joe took Joe, got Joe? Well, something unusual happened because they didn't even find his skis. They didn't find the camera. They didn't find anything other than what was there when he was loading the camera. Some of these cases really bother me because I could have been Joe Carter. I've climbed a lot of mountains. I would have gone skiing like he did. Exactly, I would have done that. I would have volunteered to go first and I would have taken the photos. Again, would this have happened if someone else had skied with him to that point? It's a good question. Again, the person was alone. Ed Gross was alone. 
point of separation. He walked away from his hunting companions that one day. Anton Cahoot, point of separation. He was alone when berry picking. I've tried to hammer this in over the years to stay together. Don't separate. None of these people, folks, none of them thought this would happen to them that day. I know there's a lot of uh, very uh, masculine men that watch this. They think, ah, it'll never happen to me. I don't think any of the victims I've chronicled think it would, it would have happened to them either. So, thanks for being here. I greatly appreciate it. You can follow me at Truth Social at David Politis. On Twitter, David Politis, the Can-Am Missing. Our website, the Can-Am, like Canadian American, canammissing.com. And uh, it's about 85 degrees outside. I'm going to go outside right now do some work, enjoy the weather, enjoy my new hat, and be grateful that I have the village here and we're together as a group to think these through and talk these things through and understand them at a different level. All your ideas are appreciated. You can post something right under this video. All the links to our documentary movies that are for free on YouTube and on uh, Amazon are linked right under this under description of the video. And the location to purchase our books are right there as well. Be safe, take care of your family, stay together when you're in the woods. Remember, we care about you. The US and Montana. God bless America. Politis out.